So we've just picked Tad Williams up from SFO Airport to get him to his uh, next signing tour event at uh, Borderlands Bookstore in San Francisco. Uh, so uh, we just kind of kidnapped you <laughs> in front of the airport. Um, yeah, I was just walking down, <laughs> headed to the taxi rent. I hear Tad! And there's Cindy. It was quite startling. So, um, the idea was that instead of asking you about the new book, uh, The Witchwood Crown, uh, we we're actually going to talk about book touring uh -huh. since we've like sort of inserted ourselves in the middle of your book tour. So um, I know you have a longer tour uh, planned in October in Europe, um, and you were in Seattle, yes, last night, right? Right. Okay. Um, and you're in San Francisco today. Um, are do you have any other stops? Um, well, there's various and sundry things I know that I have set in around the Bay Area and stuff. Um, I don't seem to have anything. I mean, this is all kind of mysterious to me because people just sort of call us up or send us emails and say, oh, and we booked this for you, or oh, we booked this for you. But there doesn't seem to be a concerted American tour thing going on, which I wasn't entirely certain about until uh, fairly recently. So um, it's all kind of catch as catch can at the moment. So what was the first book tour that you went on? Uh, which book was that for? Uh, well, Tail Chasers or no, Dragonbone Chair? Yeah, I probably was back around Dragonbone Chair or maybe even Stone of Farewell, I'm not sure. Um, that was also back in the days where there was a lot more touring going on because, you know, in the publishing industry's margins are much slimmer than they used to be and one of the things that's very expensive is touring. So, because, you know, not only are they sending you out, they're paying for hotel rooms, they're right. paying for drivers, they're paying for all this kind of stuff. Whereas I got mine today for free. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm sure the publishers we're, we're, we're love happy, that, right? We're happy to do it. Yeah, well. Um, so, was touring, on your first book tour, was it anything like what you imagined? What did you think it was going to be like? Um... You know, I really had no idea. I, I was just kind of, I, I tend to go into all of these things with, with uh, just eyes open and just going, well, whatever happens, happens. So I didn't have any fantasies about, you know, there are going to be thousands of people lining the streets and flinging confetti at me like a returning astronaut or something. You know, I just went. I didn't know you wanted confetti. I could have arranged that. Well, yeah. No, I'm, I'm kind of past my confetti stage. I, now I just want dog-like devotion from all of my readers and cookies. You know, other than that. Um, Angela, where are the cookies? No, don't worry, because, <laughs> because Maya Glick up in Seattle took care of that, and Maya brought me cookies, which oh, I okay. haven't even eaten yet, which are in the trunk. Well, I had one, and they were very good. Um, but so, yeah, no, I never kind of have expectations. Um, I tend to just want to see what's happening. And I knew also from having done a lot of book signings and things in the Bay Area that book signings are very strange things. Sometimes you will go to a place where it seems like there's every reason you should have a big turnout and you get like four people or something. Mm -hmm. Other times you go to little hole in the wall bookstores, you know, in places, towns you've never even heard of. And for whatever reason, either because the bookstore is really good or because they have a really devoted, you know, science fiction following or there's a, you know, a local college that you didn't know about where there's a lot of readers. And then you turn up and there's just tons and tons of people. So I, I just learned a long time ago that there's always, from a practical point of view, from a pragmatic point of view, there's always value in whatever event you're doing, even if there's hardly any people there. I mean, for one thing, they're the ones who came. You're not going to punish them because you didn't get as many people as you'd hope to get. You know, that's the, the kind of the, the apex of stupid. Um, but also there are, you know, bookstore people to me and the media people who take you around because Bookstore people and media people, you see them again and again, or they go to other places and they spread the word. So, you know, if you treat them respectfully and enjoy meeting them and get to know them, then they're going to remember you fondly. Whereas if you kind of are irritated with things and you're complaining and they may be nice to your face, but they're secretly thinking, what a jerk you are. I'm going to tell everybody I know. Yeah, you know? Yeah. To, be, to be honest, though, I'm fortunate in the sense that I've always liked meeting people. I love readers. I love bookstore employees. I, I have been or am both of those things, you know, and um, so I, I'm always happy when I go out to meet whoever comes, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled 
still to this day I'm thrilled that anybody knows who I am and wants to come and hear me talk about my work or have me sign a book you know and people show up at the signings with you know every single book I've ever written you know and they thunk them down on the table and then they the first thing they do is say I'm That's sorry what I to do you to bring all your books to thunk down on the yeah. table <laughs> no but the first thing they do is say I'm sorry and I'm like you're sorry for having a lot of my books and wanting to come and meet me and have me sign them you know, I don't understand that kind of sorry you know that sounds like a compliment to me so so I, what was the strangest things that ever happened on a book track? Because you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. So I, you've been to a lot of places, Yeah, right? the weird thing about me and my readers, and yes, you should definitely take this personally, um, is that I don't think I've ever yet met a reader of mine that I wasn't comfortable with and didn't think seemed like a nice person or somebody that I could be like sitting next to on a bus and be perfectly happy about it, you know? We'd find things to talk about and... Um, but I, I've definitely seen it. I mean, I remember way back, many, many, many years ago, I did an event with Clive Barker in Manchester, England. And it was the first time I'd met Clive, so we were sort of talking while we were signing, you know, kind of getting to know each other. And Clive had the weirdest fans. I mean, many of them were just wonderful, normal people. But some of them were genuinely the kind of fans you'd expect a very kind of fascinatingly weird horror writer to have. And so he was kind of, you know, I was saying, you know, do you ever have any fans who make you uncomfortable? Because I've never experienced that. And just as I said that, this, this guy in sort of full 1990 goth regalia came up and said, uh, uh, Clive, uh, I made this for you. And like pushed this like bird carcass onto the desk with like a, some kind of weird knife or letter open or something like jammed through it. I, I Fortunately, I think the bird had been taxidermied or something, you know, but with all these weird things, hailing bones hanging off of it. And, and, and Clive just sort of looked at it and went, lovely, thank you. And as soon as the guy was away, he kind of pushed it over down the, you know, it's like, God knows what might be the crawling around right, inside exactly. that thing. And, um, and then later on, you know, a couple of years later at another convention, I met a Clive fan and um, she was talking to me about how she loved Clive because he was all about understanding how pain is this and suffering is this and all that. And I was going, you know, I hate to disabuse people of their fondly held notions, but I actually know Clive and he's actually a pretty normal guy. And he certainly wouldn't want you to hurt yourself, you know, and that wouldn't be the way he would want you to interact with his work. Um, he may write about pain and things like that, but I don't think he particularly wants to go through it himself, at least not the involuntary sort, you know. Uh, I don't think he's a cutter or anything like that. And, and it kind of confirmed for me how, how lucky I am at the relative normality of most of my readers. So I don't really have that many... We can still surprise you. Oh, oh yeah, I know. I, sh I shouldn't tempt fate, should I? Especially not when one of my readers is driving the car right now. Um, oh, you're not scared yet, Tad, says Angela. Um, but, Don't tell me. But no, I mean, so the most of my weird experiences are the kind of things like when you show up and the bookstore has gone out of business, you know. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, had, I had one tour where there was a kind of, a, it, it was not very well booked, and so, you know, things would cancel out at the last moment, or you'd show up and the bookstore was literally gone, boarded up, you know, and you're going, when was the last time the publicist checked out on this particular event? It can't have been very recently. Um, but by and large, no, they're, they're, like I said, they're not, they're, they're fun experiences for me. Um, and this includes, you know, I've been to now, I've done book signings in many, many countries. Mm -hmm. And one of the things also that I always say to people is that, you know, if you get into uh, what I think of as a, a horizontal community, um, meaning not a community based on where you live or something like that, but on interests that you share, you usually have more in common with those people, even in other countries, mm -hmm. than you do in, you know, a, a vertical community of some kind, like people who work together, you right. know, or, or people who, you know, do in fact um, all live in the same neighborhood or, or whatever. So it's really interesting when I go, you know, I've, I've done book signings in, in Asia and in, you know, lots of them in Europe and all over the States and, you know, I mean, interesting places like Zagreb, and Croatia and stuff like that. And I've always felt very much at home because, first off, they're readers, 
And second of all, they like my stuff. And you know, my books are me in a lot of ways. I right. mean, they're expressions of what I care about and what I think about. So most of the time, almost the entire time, I feel very kind of protected and enveloped when I'm in a group of my readers. I've always felt like, you know, these are people that I automatically have a connection to. And in fact, one last thing on this subject, um, Deborah, my wife, Deborah Beal, once said to me, um, you know, you're like the opposite of a police officer in terms of your job. And I said, that's a very bizarre thing to say, honey. What does that mean? Um, that, I, <laughs> that I run from trouble or something? <laughs> she said, no, no, no. But in your job, you almost always see people in the best possible situation. You know, they're, they're coming to see you. They're interested in you. They, they want to communicate with you. They want to be friends with you if possible. They love what you do. Whereas obviously police officers oftentimes Time to see people at their worst, you know, and I realize that she's absolutely right. I have this very skewed view of, of humanity. Well, I don't know if it is skewed, but I have a very particularly narrow view of humanity based on book signings of like all these wonderful, cool people who come to see me and bring me things and take pictures with me and tell what me that the they... oddest thing anyone's brought you as a gift. I mean, aside from cookies, of course, we love cookies, but um, not. The oddest thing, somebody actually brought me a really beautiful handmade mirror. Oh. But I was in Germany, I think, at the time, you know, and the thing weighed like 45 pounds. It was bigger than my suitcase. You know, it was made out of all this fragile mm -hmm. material Would as well this as the mirror itself. Was this before Shadow March? I possibly? think it probably was. I think it was probably around there. and Or it might have been Otherland. But it was definitely one of those two series and um, so on the one hand I mean this woman had made this herself it was a beautiful thing on the other hand she just sort of showed up at this thing went here I made this for you and there's this immense thing that you know and I still had two weeks of a tour left oh. you know there's no way I can throw an extra because especially in, in, in Europe um, you know you're usually traveling by train so mm -hmm. it's, it's tough enough anyway with two or three weeks worth of clothing in a suitcase running in and out of stations you know the escalators and elevators don't work you're always going up and down the stairs with this gigantic suitcase I wasn't gonna throw another 45 or 50 pounds into it so I had to get somebody from the, the publishing company there to um, to mail it home for me the other weird one that I that off the top of my head was Somebody came to me at a, at a convention or somewhere in Poland or, again, maybe Germany, and uh, oh, they're after uh, you, Angela. Yeah. They know. Welcome to San Francisco. They know. Anyway, somebody came to me at a, either you know, a convention or something and said, well, I heard that you love whiskey and fishing. So I couldn't bring you like uh, any fish, but I brought you this whiskey. And you know, I've never been a whiskey drinker my whole life. I, the last time I went fishing that I remember, I was probably nine years old with my parents, and we were at, you know near Mount Lassen somewhere, and I caught a rainbow trout and realized that it really made me upset to kill something that I didn't particularly want to eat because I'm not a fish eater uh, by nature, and um, and I didn't have the heart at the time to say. You know, I don't know where that information came from, but it's either a completely different writer or a really bad translator, because <laughs> I can't imagine anything that I ever said that could be construed as my two favorite occupations were drinking whiskey and fishing. Um, but it, you know, it was a sincere gift. So but was I, it good whiskey though? It was a very nice whiskey as I recall. And what I did was I gave it to one of the people in the publishing company who did like whiskey. So I'm sure it went to good use. Again, it was something I would have had to carry around for two or three weeks. And my wife doesn't drink whiskey either. She's a red wine woman, you know? So, you know, I, I really didn't feel I had any choice but to give it away to somebody. I wasn't going to drink it. So I wanted someone to get this since somebody had been kind enough to go out and spend whatever 30, 40 euros on a bottle of whiskey for me. So, you know, they're kind of things like that, but my most of my stories are not horror stories. You know, they're mostly all stories about nice, interesting people in nice, interesting places, so kind of boring, really. Does anyone come out in costume to your signings? Um, not specifically. Uh, once, or, once, or, once or twice, I think, but again, um, I have this my fandom or my readerdom tends to be people who are really book people, 
you know, as compared to people who are um, costuming first and foremost, or they're into the visual side of things or whatever. I mean, maybe that's because I write these huge, huge books and because nothing of mine has ever been on television yet. But, you know, there's, they're very much, they tend to be readers. So there are people that look like the rest of the people in the bookstore. And it's only, you know, when, when you speak to them, you find out that they have this unspeakable, disturbing habit of reading Tad Williams books. But other than that, they're almost normal. So, uh, not too many, yeah, almost. <laughs> almost. I did, I did use the qualifier. So, oh dear, that's a really nasty looking accident there. Yeah. Somebody Whoa. has flipped their car upside down, I, but it yep. looks like they've gotten them out of it. And there was no fire or anything, so. Wow. We'll, we'll okay. keep our fingers crossed everybody's okay. San Francisco. San Francisco. Well, big city driving. So, you have a longer book tour scheduled at, um, in October, right, in Germany. Yeah. So, what all, do you know where you're going yet? Or? Well, I'm when I go to Germany, I usually do quite a few cities um, because, you know, as, as some of my readers know from reading things that I write online or whatever, I'm quite well known. Um, for a you have a huge following in Germany. I do. I've been very, very lucky. Part of it was good timing. Part of it was having a brilliant publishing company there um, and still having that same brilliant publishing company. Um, but so I'm going to Germany, um, I'm going to Belgium, I'm going to the Netherlands, oh, nice. and um, I'm also going, where else are we going this trip? It's not Poland, is it? I've just gone blank, it'll come back to me, but um, four, four different places, and uh, so it'll be a fairly busy trip. And Deborah is England, you on England, England, sorry, of course. Oh, England. yeah, England. Well, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't have to practice any of my other languages for right. England, so I, I forgot it for a moment. No, they and basically have just kind of amalgamated, you know, just again, because it's expensive to fly an author over and put them up. So if you can split the cost with several other publishers, especially with me, because I eat a lot, so. And Deborah's joining you on this trip. She is. This will be the first time she's ever done a full long tour with me. She's gone to gone with me to the Netherlands for an event, and she's gone with me to Germany for an event. Um, but this is the first time she's ever traveled with me for a longish longest stretch so that'll be fun. Well she, will, she need, will she have an opportunity to uh, visit family when, in England? In England? Very possibly. All, uh, again I don't know what the English tour is going to be like. I haven't seen the details but Deborah's family is in the West Midlands mm -hmm. so obviously most of the stuff happens in and around London but if they're sending me out on a tour I'm sure Birmingham which is the general area will right. be one of them. So and, and you know we love Deb's family. It would be great fun to, oh, yeah, to see sure. her no matter what. So you're also going to the Netherlands. I didn't know that. Another place that, and I think the the Belgian trip is right. connected to the Netherlands. So Netherlands, I would would imagine that would be uh, Amsterdam area. Well, again, I don't know what they have planned yet, but if they're sending me to Belgium as well, then my guess is there will probably be several stops in the Netherlands and then over to Belgium. So, you know, I may very well do. Um, so that's going to be a Rotterdam long as trip. well and. Uh, Den Haag and mm -hmm. who knows so, so that's that's a pretty long trip it's, it's like three four weeks yeah yeah wow it's pretty much the month of October and and our none of our kids have gotten their driver's licenses yet so we keep oh, yes. we keep giving them these <laughs> dire warnings about like you know guys we're not joking when we say we're going on a trip in October it's really gonna happen we're gonna be gone most of the month and if you can't drive you will starve to death mm -hmm. <laughs> you know or you will have Although, to I, you know the grocery store Safeway does home delivery now Shh. oh sorry God, please this is the only <laughs> Maybe we should cut is, that out of the <laughs> this is the only stick I have we've been doing this with our oldest for like two years now everywhere I go Everywhere I go, everybody I talk to, anywhere near my age, is like, yeah, the millennials just aren't interested in driving. It's like none of them are in a hurry to do it because I guess, you know, with all the new technologies. Which is you really, can... you know, because for us, it was like as soon as you turned 16, it was Absolutely. like, oh, I'm driving. Literally on your birthday in yeah. my peer group, you were at the DMV because it was your 16th birthday and you wanted your license and you'd been ready. You know, you'd already had six months of learner's permit and you were ready. But yeah, I mean, I think the combination, the fact that they can, you know, I came upstairs the other night and they were talking with one of their, one of our very close family friends, who's my oldest, his, his best friend. And the, the, the audio was so good, I thought he had showed up. 
and you know was just sitting on the couch with him I walk past and there's all of my kids and I hear Max's voice this friend and I just kind of went oh hey Max and walked past and somebody um, pointed out to me when I went back through because I asked him another question they said I don't think he can hear you because there's too many people talking on this end and I suddenly went this end and I went oh crap he's not even here you know, I just thought he was in the house. Yeah. So, you know, obviously the pressure is not so great, right. you know, for, for this group to get out because they, they can bring in almost everything they want. Most of the things they're interested in doing have an electronic screen attached to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can FaceTime or whatever with their friends. I'm sure at this point now they're, they've are they moved far beyond FaceTime and it's probably like, you know, talking about the telegraph or something. People are, <laughs> everybody under 20, they're snickering, I, I'm you know. I'm still on Skype, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know what this FaceTime thing they're, is. I'm sure that, you know, that I'm just as far behind as you are and they're snickering at me for even talking about FaceTime. I mean, FaceTime. even doing this video interview right now is like the height of technology for me, right? It's like, how are we doing this? Oh, yeah, we have a phone. Yeah, Yay. exactly. Well, I've never been afraid of technology. I worked for Apple Computer for a while. I like technology just fine, but I'm, I'm not a technology for technology's sake guy. So everybody's going, have you found this yet? Do you try this app yet? And I'm going like, until I need it, Yeah. no. You know, when I need it, I'll go and see what's out there to augment my already complicated life in some way. But, you know, I don't really need every new gadget that comes down the pike because things are changing quickly. So how, how do you pack for a four-week trip? Um, well, that is actually a very good question. And uh, there's the, the main answer is wear a lot of black. Mm, That's so everything why everything matches. Everything matches and it doesn't show all the wine stains and, you know, the bits of pasta sauce and you know you can just scrub it on your nose right now I'm wearing black jeans I can't tell you how many things I've spilled on these just in the last 48 hours but you know it's, you just get a washcloth and some water and just wipe the spots off and it doesn't really show um, it, yeah that's one thing because the other problem with touring as compared to going to visit somewhere for a month is you get no opportunity to do laundry. Yeah, because you're, you're going you're one going, place to another, exactly, to another, to yeah. another, so you don't really have any downtime. You're never around long enough to pick anything up again. So, yeah, you try to find things that don't show stains. Um, if you're on a really long trip, sometimes you just figure, I will buy a couple of new shirts while mm. I'm on the road so that I have at least a couple of nights where I look relatively unwrinkled. And you take a huge suitcase, which is what I always do, and you pack in a very, like, what do I know I'm going to absolutely have to have, you know, and um, anything I don't, I'll buy some, you know, I'll buy some more socks or whatever if I need them. Yeah, that's always my thing with socks and underwear. It's like, how do you have enough? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and really at a certain point, you know, in a trip that long, if you're not going to get to wash anything, you're going to be buying more stuff. But, you know, that's just the main thing is, is just take a big suitcase and hope you don't have to go up and down too many, you know, train station or airport stairs. Yeah. Because um, it's hell on the back. And, you know, you wear a lot of dark clothes and everything has to pretty much go with everything else. You know, you just, you know, if you've got, you know, a pair, you know, if you got one pair of shoes that has red shoelaces, then basically you better not take anything that doesn't go with red. red. You know, <laughs> I mean, at least as a, as a, uh, you know, as, a, as an ornament or something, you know, something that works with, with that. So yeah, there's no big secret to it. There's, I wish I knew some really useful way or that I'd found self-cleaning clothes or something. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? See, and that's the kind of technology that when that happens, yes. right, when that happens, I will be on that sucker like white on rice. I will just be there. I'll be like, <laughs> give me 50 of those now, Right. you know? But until something like that happens, it's like, now nah, you do it the old fashioned way. Well, um, I think we are nearing our destination. San Francisco, uh, I am in you again. Yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for letting us interview, pop this interview on you, surprise. Yeah, thank you for, for surprising me in such a nice way. So I was in my we'll, airport mode. Yeah, hopefully we'll have this up on YouTube like real soon. It doesn't matter because I will never look at it. Oh. The last thing I ever want to do, especially when I've been touring, <laughs> is watch me talking about myself. It's boring enough having to talk about myself, but having to watch me talking about myself is really I would rather have somebody take a power drill to the back of my skull and just start oh. digging exploratory holes you know I just like it's because when you know when I do a signing or something and there are a number of very brave very strange people out there who want to take pictures with me 
and that's absolutely fine with me. I'm always happy to accommodate, you know, I wanna make sure people get a picture that they like, so I'll tell them, have a look at it, you know, if you don't like it, we'll take another. But then they always sh wanna show it to me, and I'm like, I don't wanna <laughs> see me. I'm, I'm so bored with me, you know? And every time I look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm older and weirder looking, so. You know, no thank you. If you guys want it, that's great, and I'm happy for you. But please don't make me look at myself or listen to myself talk. Okay, we'll just tell everybody else that's when fine. we have it. I, I always appreciate <laughs> that. If it's anything that helps me find readers is just good. I love it. Thank you, Todd. Very welcome. Thank you.